and welcome. Uh, I want to start first off just by introducing myself and the panelists. My name is Jim Menendez. I'm with CGI. Uh, CGI is one of the top five consulting firms in the world. We cut across a lot of different critical infrastructure, utilities, banking, healthcare, et cetera. I am with the cybersecurity practice within CGI Federal. So we are a horizontal that provides cybersecurity services to both government and commercial customers working through our different business units. Um, and it is my privilege to be here this morning moderating this panel. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to my participants. Thanks in advance. And uh, everybody just want to give a brief intro. So my name's Tom Newth, or Thomas Newth, if you want to be super proper with it. Uh, I am the only private sector person here uh, from Nozomi Networks, um, outside of CGI, of course. Uh, we're, uh, we have the pleasure of being a partner uh, with CGI, su supplying and providing some insight for what we call ICS uh, cybersecurity, passively deployed, so industrial control systems. Uh, Nozomi Networks, a little qu uh, quick introduction, been around for, since 2013, quite late. Um, we, since VC funding and moving to the states in 2013, we've grown quite quite quickly, um, and uh, you know we apply uh, uh, AI techniques to industrial control systems, everything from uh, PLCs, RTUs, controllers, end nodes that exist between layer 3.5 and zero. So um, you're going to see a lot of discussion about endpoint security that are enterprise, mobile devices, things to this nature. We really take a, a look at uh, the critical infrastructure that powers our grids controls our traffic systems and telematics, uh, process, processing facilities for oil and gas, uh, anything that uh, if it breaks down, um, there's a big problem, uh, we secure that. So that's my background and I'll pass it to the left. Uh, my name is Brian Willett. I'm a supervisory special agent with the FBI. Uh, I've been with the FBI for about 14 years now, most of it working cyber investigations. Uh, so I currently uh, work just a few minutes away from here in our Orange County RA where I supervise and uh, lead a cyber squad which handles uh, intrusions, whether it's infrastructure or uh, just attacks on businesses uh, here in Orange County. And we also stretch out and cover the entire Inland Empire, Riverside and San Bernardino counties. Uh, so we're usually the first one called when there's any kind of a, a even medium to significant incident uh, in those three counties. And uh, then we have agents that would deploy out to conduct the uh, criminal investigation component of it. I'm uh, Darren McElroy. I'm with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. I'm Chief of Operations for uh, our Cybersecurity Advisor Program. Our Cybersecurity Advisor Programs live locally uh, in uh, state and local areas and essentially serve state, local, tribal, territorial governments and critical infrastructure owners and operators. Uh, and our role really is part of the uh, DHS cybersecurity effort. Uh, we work alongside with our National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, which includes the Industrial Control Systems CERT, the ICS CERT, uh, US CERT, and some other elements. So uh, happy to be here, and uh, thanks for joining. Well, thank you. And um, as you see, we've got different perspectives on the topic, so really encourage conversation. I'm really looking forward to the next 45 minutes. We'll actually go probably until about 10 to 10 to 11, and then we'll go into some questions. But again, welcome and thank you, panelists. So cybersecurity and critical infrastructures, I mean, what is that? I think, I think Jake made a comment earlier this morning that it's, you know, now you look at information technology and cybersecurity, it's a public safety issue. Um, I'll contend that looking at critical infrastructure, do we pay enough attention about it or do we even understand it? And, you know, you look at the presidential executive order, it talked about safeguarding critical infrastructure. You'll read different bills, it talks about critical infrastructure. But, you know, there's a, there's a difference in an operational technology environment and um, what goes on with industrial control systems and securing those systems. And, you know, to be honest, when you've got 30 different sessions here today, and this is the only one on ICS SCADA, it's, you know, you wonder, are we, are we actually paying enough attention to the issue that's out there? And I think there's a lot to look at in terms of the, you know, in terms of the impact of an industrial control system breach. Uh, everything from loss of production to loss of lives. I mean, this is, these are great con consequences. As I mentioned, it's all public safety issue that we've really got to look at it and, and, and really accept that there are threat actors in, around the world now that make this a real issue that before I don't, you know, we hadn't really paid attention to industrial control systems, but 
We've had se several incidents over the past few years that says this is real. Um, I think it's something that we need to be more proactive and be prepared for potential attacks and breaches and be able to have, you know, as we talked in the earlier session, the people, the process, the technologies there. Um, and really, right now from a panel perspective, and, and maybe we'll start with you, Darren, I mean, from a DHS perspective, what's your take on the threat to industrial control systems currently? Well, I mean, in terms of the, uh, we look at it in terms of risk oftentimes and, and the, the vulnerabilities that exist within industrial control systems. Just by a quick show of hands, how many of you are industrial control systems owners and operators? Okay. And the others in the critical infrastructure space? Um, anyway, so if you think, just think about, you know, the popular topic these days, Internet of Things, right? We're building... Uh, refrigerators that talk to the internet, uh, you know, network devices, light bulbs, you name it, right? They're not being designed with security built in mind. They're not being, um, and that's modern day. That's, that's after all of these years of attacks against, uh, you know, IT systems, OT systems, et cetera. Now, think back 20 years ago when a lot of these, 10, 20 years ago when a lot of these control, industrial control systems were designed, right? We've got uh, you know, vulnerabilities that are baked into to, uh, the firmware that, you know, can't be updated, hard-coded passwords, uh, so that the, the vulnerability environment that we see out there is, is, is very, uh, very open and very vulnerable in many cases. And increasingly, business is driving uh, the, the, the perspective that we need to, you know, we need to get the data from the control system into the business environment, and oftentimes that's not done in a way that is engineered for security. Um, so that's really, I think, the lays a lot of the groundwork for the concerns that we have as an organization when you're not actually building security in and, you know, sometimes not even bolting it on. Um. Brian, any, any, any comments you'd like to make? Uh, from the FBI's perspective, so I, mean, w I would echo everything that uh, Darren just said. Uh, it, it's, it's very concerning to us because of the um, uh, open vulnerable systems uh, that we would have to potentially respond to um, and, and just the impact on the government in general if you had a significant attack in our area. It's, it's very easy to sort of paint the doom and gloom uh, situation of the electric grid or, or something uh, very significant. Um, being disrupted and it's something that we would of course immediately respond to and it's it's a good example of something where both of our agencies would be instantly involved at the at the forefront probably asking some of the very same questions but uh, i i would just echo his exact same concern there you know this is why i thought joining this panel would be great because we have the you know preventative and you also have the compliance angle that's coming from law enforcement and also you have the forensic analysis so uh, from Nozomi's perspective, and you know what we're doing with CGI is to provide real-time visibility, but also have a historical view so that you can have some intelligence. And when it really comes down to it, visibility and a historical log of all connected nodes within your critical infrastructure, um, and that means a lot of different things for different uh, verticals and different vertical scenarios. Um, and I guess I saw all the hands raised here earlier. Uh, you, you know that your network's non-homogenous. It, it consists of various devices, various protocols, um, implemented over a, pe you know, a period of 40 years, and most of them between 25 and some last year. Um, these devices uh, are varying in their intelligence, their computational power, and as I mentioned earlier, their protocols. So it's all about visibility, having a real-time ability to track anomalies, uh, and quickly understand what those anomalies are. Um, if you're able to attain that higher degree of visibility and intelligence, not only are you able to react and contain threats uh, if they're integrated with firewalls, SIMs, or whatever mechanisms or platforms you already have in the field that are active, uh, but you're able to actually more easily comply with the standards of the federal government uh, for a mechanism of operational safety as well as cybersecurity and physical security, uh, and you're able to provide a forensic analysis or log of this is what happened, this is where it happened, this is how it happened, and this is what we don't know. We certainly know what we don't know, uh, and that's a big step. I think, you know, in the kickoff meeting, they talked about a zero-day attack sitting on your network for, what was it, seven years? Yeah. Basically 6.9 years. Um, that's something that you want to be able to at least identify that something is not nor normal or stand standard operation within your network, and you can do that um, if you're tracking anomalies. So. 
that's our perspective, um, and uh, I think it's a good fit, actually, here on this panel. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's an interesting point, and, and we were talking before, I mean, NERC's got a rule out, and Darren, you may know about this, but just changing the reporting requirements. So currently, right now, I think NERC has report for an incident, but, but you're missing all of these unsuccessful incidents, and how many times is someone going out and probing probing industrial control systems to collect information to set up their, you know, to set up their kill chain and get the attack vector. And that's where I, I think, and, and Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, what, 2014, there were three reported incidents, and 15 and 16, there were zero. And it, it just points out that whole issue from an industrial control system cyber perspective is you don't have the visibility, you don't have information sharing like you do with, um, with all the ISACs to gather intelligence data. And, and, the, and the metrics are skewed. So that's why, you know, certainly people can walk around fat, dumb, and happy thinking that nothing's going on. But, you know, the fact that we're, you don't have the mechanisms in place, I mean, shows that, that there's a lot of room for improvement. And then what's invariably going to happen, same as with cyber, I mean, the reason why you go through spells and the metrics go up and there's a 30% increase isn't because there's more attacks. It's just that more people are identifying them. And I think that just shows that that's one area of attention is to be able to get that visibility into the environment. Um, so really, you know, think about it and as I mentioned, you know, you look at one session here, um, I'm certainly pleased, this, this is a great crowd, but you know, there's a lot of focus on IT and everybody's looking at IT and you know, I don't think there's as much a focus on industrial control systems and the reality of it, and I think this is really interesting, is that People think industrial control systems, they may be thinking just a power plant, a nuclear power plant, but you've got your traffic lights, you've got air conditioning, you've got, as Darren had mentioned with the, with the IoT devices, I mean, it's all over, it's pervasive, so we've got to figure out how we change our security models to protect that. But it's not, you know, there is good reason, and I like to put this up just to, just to show the differences, and this really goes back to you know, we talk about the IT and OT operating in silos because they're largely very different from a, from a support perspective, perhaps the OT systems at, the, at a power supply or, or out at a, a power plant are reporting into a production manager. Um, you've got the inability to be able to go out and roll out software updates and changes. In fact, we've got within CGI a team supporting one of our oil accounts. And our quote unquote cybersecurity engineers, they got on a they got on a helicopter and fly out to an oil rig with a with a thumb drive. I mean that's how they do patching. And these guys are, you know, they they'll go on an oil rig for six months and they're doing patching. And I'm I'm sitting there thinking around this this goes back even to the question of defined cybersecurity. Is it the uh, you know, is it Monzi seeing people roaming around and having all these slick tools or is it a guy in overalls with, uh, you know, with, with safety glasses on carrying that thumb drive, and it's, it's all around the hygiene and protection of the system. So, you know, this looks at, even from a cultural perspective, perhaps the two organizations didn't even, you know, didn't even historically interact, but we're seeing more and more of that convergence where you've got to, you know, understand the interconnectedness, the fact that you've got the internet that's, that's being used by um, now being more and more being rolled out in some of the SCADA systems. Uh, Tom, what's your, you're actually, so Tom did not mention, but he also comes from the, the customer side as opposed to also being product vendor side. So he's got a little bit of an insight from what it is like to be at, on those plants. Yeah, I, I know that you know, operators here in this audience, OTIT, that whole conversation, yes, it's full of marketing jargon, and I come from marketing, I'm guilty of that. Uh, product marketing, it's a little different. But uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I come from the buy side, and uh, how I got into the space actually is, I was industrial networking, so the Cisco's, the Rockwell's, the Siemens of the world, um, I, I played in that that background. and. You know, for a number of years, we went to, and we knew security was an issue. We knew security for industrial systems was an issue. I would go to breakout sessions, and I would come out more confused with a supposed es uh, expert, and no answers, really. So what we set out to do initially was to, um, you know, look for vendors that uh, played a passive approach. And so when you're approaching IT security, it doesn't really matter, right? It's it's preventative. It's what we call protective using SIMs, using firewalls. The challenge for uh, my background earlier on in our customers is how do we actually bring first-rate 
you know, network visibility without injecting packets in the network, causing another vulnerability in, in a sense, and perhaps taxing the network and causing network failure due to latency. Um, and uh, that was the initial issue that brought me to Nozomi and kind of, you know, led me to the space I am now. Um, and now, how do you feed that back up to IT so that they can make an actionable, and so you're not providing just another tool, another dashboard, another screen, another system that needs to be updated every four years. Uh, and uh, that's really where you have to evaluate technologies on their API status. So I've said this earlier to them, but it's saying you, you have passively deployed and you, you're able to conduct robust anomaly detection is like saying your automobile has an engine doesn't really differentiate yourself from any other car. That needs to be tested in a POC. How much can you see and how quickly, and uh, an API, how quickly or how readily can you integrate that with existing SIMs, with existing firewalls, so that you can take the data insights from your OT network and enforce policy against them. You can identify, you know, somebody trying to gain access into your network. You can assign, you know, unique rules and rights to tenants or departments or employees across a, a geo-distributed enterprise. Uh, so that API component uh, is to use the same lame uh, an an analogy to cars is like saying you have wheels in the cars. That also needs to be tested in a POC environment. Um, can you extract data, but can you also have your existing infrastructure act on that by severing connections and enforcing policy? So that's my feedback. Good. So, so, so Darren, um, you know, we talked about convergence and the interaction. I mean, so you've got the ICS cert. How is that? interacting with some of the more traditional industry search? Is there information sharing, data sharing? Do you see them coming together? Yeah, so there's um, the National Cybersecurity and, uh, Communications Integration Center is really designed to drive a lot of that integration. So we have uh, the ISPs, the, so the, the um, Information Sharing uh, Analysis Center, the ISAC, for the communications sector. Um, so, you know, think all the big ISPs, satellite companies, it's actually co-located on the floor with our, uh, our IT and OT folks. So Industrial Control Systems CERT, U.S. CERT is currently, uh, currently essentially integrating in with the larger NCIC. So building those information sharing relationships with the information sharing and analysis centers like the FS ISAC, uh, Water ISAC. Uh, there's a lo large number of ISACs out there, and we're actually encouraging the uh, development of information sharing and analysis organizations. Those may be uh, locally driven, they may be um, regionally driven, or they may be uh, industry driven. Uh, so doing a lot of work uh, in that space as well. So um, trying to encourage the, the information sharing not only with uh, DHS, with FBI, but within industry, uh, developing those best practices and, and sharing um, those best practices, uh, which and if you've ever if you've never been to the ICS CERT webpage, uh, it's a phenomenal resource. Um, you've got uh, self-assessments, facilitated assessments, um, you know, best practices documents, sample diagrams, uh, things things of that nature. So it's really a great uh, resource uh, for you to to. to not only engage with on your own, but to seek out ways to collaborate, like our industrial control systems joint working group, uh, things like that. Real quick on that note, too. It's all gonna be. Yeah, and on that note, the ICS CERT site, um, Nozomi just published a, a, a vulnerability that I'm not gonna name the vendor, but to his point, it's, it's actionable. We're publishing vulnerabilities so that we can actually patch them. You can actually go, and more will be coming out, of course, but. Uh, you can definitely go there and actually figure out not only where vulnerabilities exist, but how to quickly, you know, remedy them. So just to echoing that point. And the comment I would have to that is um, definitely over the last few years, we see a, a larger increase in information sharing between in pretty much every industry. Uh, on the ICS, you know, SCADA side, it's a little slower as, 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 as they already know that. <clears throat> uh, to go ahead and adopt that information sharing. It's important to do, and it's important for um, and the, the purpose I'm even here at this panel to say, we do see attackers targeting these kind of networks. We do see uh, uh, complaints coming in to uh, share this information with us so we can start opening investigations. So it's me telling you we do see these kind of attacks actually disrupt activities. Not everything is going to make the, uh, you know, make the paper. Not everything is going to be necessarily a catastrophic attack. It may just be something that was, you know, kind of a near miss kind of a thing or a, 
a patch they were able to implement fairly quickly, get the attackers act, but they saw attackers briefly within their network. And so knowing from the FBI side we are investigating these kind of cases should let you know that it's not just theoretical, the discussion here, but it's actually, uh, it's actually happening and we're seeing it and responding to it. So, so I'm, I'm curious, Brian, what type of, when you go on an incident response, what type of forensic evidence is there or how are you doing analysis of an attack and, and is there, are there artifacts available that, that enable you to go through an investigation? Uh, in most cases, there, in, in pretty much every case, there's going to be some artifacts, but that's where we really are reliant as we're discussing up here, sort of that logging, anomaly detection, knowing that uh, there are artifacts for us to collect. Uh, more logging is better than less logging so that we know what exactly happened. If we can't sort of tell the story, you picture us when we get uh, a case, put it together, the goal in most, most incidents is, you know, thinking of it through in a court system of how am I going to convince a group of people that something actually happened and that one particular attacker or one group of attackers was involved. How can I tell that story? If I don't have the artifacts needed, uh, then it's going to uh, close out certain leads for us to follow up on. Uh, if there are delays in reporting to us, it closes out leads um, uh, for us to investigate. Uh, but to answer your, your question specifically, we are reliant on the uh, uh, victim here to actually have that information. Obviously, we're not collecting it on our end. We're uh, interfacing with the victim to collect the necessary, uh, necessary log files that paint this picture. There have been incidents we've gone out on where that is you know, rather thin. It may be something that we, you know, we can start to follow up on as, as best as possible, but obviously if there's less logging or, you know, we kind of get the hands up, uh, you know, we don't exactly know what happened. Uh, we see one system down or we've already wiped it and reinstalled the operating system and, and our new fresh image. Uh, it gives us less to go on. And so, and I, I would probably say the same thing from a, a Darren's standpoint. We need that evidence and we're reliant on you. I don't know your network and what your topology is when we go into the, um, when we go into a, uh, respond to a victim. We don't actually just get behind the keyboard and say step aside, we'll take it from here because we don't know that, we don't know that, uh, that local knowledge of what your network's like. We are reliant on your staff to sort of start filling in those gaps. That's why there's a lot of conversations that happen up front. But just so you know, I mean, everybody does sh or should know in this room, but time is of the essence on these. So many of these attacks start leading to, you know, IP addresses or, or other indicators overseas, uh, and we have to get on that information pretty quickly just because the requests, uh, they, they, they take time. Yep. So to piggyback on that, and it's, it's a great point, I mean, we have an industrial control system cert team that's actually goes out and will help uh, with the mitigation. But again, you know, you can engage with them, you can engage with the FBI prior to an incident, not only to understand and validate your network topology, right, um, but because <clears throat> we, we do things like design architecture reviews called actually validated architecture reviews now, um, where we can actually go out proactively and help you understand, you know, this might be your network diagram, but this is actually how you're currently configured, right? But then taking that a step further, you know, you know to your point, what is your incident management plan? Who have you engaged with in developing your incident management plan? Do you understand and know what ICS CERT or the FBI or both want to see in terms of um, or, or need to see in order to be effective within your environment, right? Um, so there's, there's a lot, there's, there's a big left of boom component to this that says, what are you, how are you building your plans? Are you incorporating the right people? Are you reaching out within your own organizations or outside? to, you know, the lawyers, to uh, IT, to, you know, the FBI, to ICS CERT, so that if something does happen or if you discover that something happened a long time ago that, you were, that you've already been compromised, how do you go about actually then implementing an effective response? So to unpack a few things from my perspective, uh, uh, I hear artifacts, logging, and then remediation or response. Uh, so what we try to do, and I guess leaders within our space, um, is to provide artifacts. We'll call it, let's call them PCAPs, packet capture. Uh, automatically, any robust system that, you know, per pervasively deployed that should do its, its worth and, and, uh, for an ICS cybersecurity solution is to definitely, definitely automatically log any alert or variant um, with a PCAP at the moment of the alert as well as the moment prior and after. Um, and that can be indefinitely saved. On a historical log, you're only limited by whatever hard drive storage you want. Um, speaking from my personal experience, we allow 
um, our users to go back in time as and use the platform and the visibility of their network nodes, IP addresses of the nodes, MAC address, protocols to and from, associated alerts. It's very interactive. You can see the entire topology of your network in real time, uh, and perhaps even uh, I guess discover new nodes or connected devices that you didn't even have in your existing log there. So. Um, uh, that's very useful for artifacts. Any solution that can come close to doing that is, is definitely going to be useful for preventative measures, but also reporting uh, artifacts when you've been compromised. Um, in addition to that, um, logging, I mentioned, that's uh, um, normally limited by how much you want to store. Um, also, for reaction or reme remediation or response to an incident, uh, whether it be you know cyber, physical, operational, or malicious w with a malware attack, for example, um, any solution that's able to automate a uh, response using, you know, out-of-box solutions that uh, use known profile, uh, malware profiles um, is useful. Um, if they have a modular approach as well that allows you to add in third-party uh, databases like YAR rules or packet rules that um, include, uh, I guess you could say, analysis packages of entire file sets or packets of known malware um, attacks. You can automate response in compliance with NERC or whomever or even your own operational requirements. Um, and then, of course, uh, the solution probably should have some ability for your IT team, your CISO team, to write custom assertions, which is beyond my technical um, skill set. But uh, you know, give me a day. I'll be able to learn a few things myself. So it's, it's user friendly. Are you just saying basically changes in your topology, more or less? So that's, that's on the external. That's an IV layer. Okay. What about on the device itself? You know, we talked about the, the USB on, on an oil ring. Sure. If someone taking a USB stick, that wouldn't show up unless you're doing egress communication. Obviously, you may capture. Uh, but uh, changes to behavior operations of the device, is there anything that extracts or monitors changes? Yeah. Well, in our personal uh, in our personal perspective, from my perspective, any traffic flow anomaly that's one standard deviation of a learned normalcy baseline um, will register as an alert. So you, that's why I always say operational. You don't necessarily require a, a rampant malware attack. We'll uncover, you know, anomalous activity that could actually be 100% legitimate. Um, yeah. Oh, of course, absolutely that. But also, just m maybe you know, CISO at particular locations sending more commands than they've ever done in the past, and it might be. Uh, you know, completely warranted. That will come up as an alert with an associated risk level using the uh, uh, NIST NVD, associated uh, alert, uh, alert rating. You could open that up quickly, uncover the devices, use the, uh, uh, I guess you could say, the variant of communication flow um, and, and protocols to and from, and say, this is, this is normal behavior, I approve this, or this is not, let's crawl into this deeper. Yeah, and that was, and when Manzi was talking, I mean, it, it, it applies across the board from a security perspective. If you remember him from the identity management, it's know your users and know the timing and, and understand what's, what's baseline. And from an industrial control system perspective, it's the same of knowing what the sy system settings are and as opposed to being signature-based attacks, it's going to be anomaly-based attacks. And if you see a valve that's off a kilter, I mean, that, that could have a disastrous attack. And now it's trying to get to the technologies so now we've just put up that, that converged IT, OT, but you'll see that now you're getting both, both of the systems together. It's understanding where the vulnerability could be introduced, and it could be coming in from a, you know, a back office system. And, and this, this, again, gets even more to the point of understanding what your total environment is and where are the points of interconnectedness that, you know, doing a risk assessment, as Darren, you said, understanding what the risks are and who's connecting to what and how that's being done, and then also going through from a technical perspective of being able to monitor the activity across the board at all the layers of the Purdue stack. Yeah, just to add to your question too, one thing that you know we've noticed a lot when we actually deploy at a POC stage with, um, a lot of times it's actually uh, you know, municipalities, utilities, some oil and gas, we actually notice deficiencies in the way that they've segmented their network. So we can see basically, uh, you know, a lack of utilization of certain bandwidth channels, or that their systems taxed. So, in a very real sense, you know, we're providing visibility and intelligence, and that's used almost oftentimes first and foremost on a daily basis, 
as an operational optimi optimization tool. And then in the case of a malware attack, that's obviously going to come into play as well. What I would add to that is, and it kind of goes back over the last question as well, um, the more you know about your network, the easier it's going to be from the investigative side. I mean, uh, it's kind of an obvious answer, but when we go in and we get a list of 200 IP addresses from, uh, from a business, it, it, it's beneficial from us for the intel side that these may have been involved. But if your confidence is fairly low that most of them invo are involved, but you're just being over-inclusive, that's a lot of extra work that has to be done. Any way that we can sort of trim that down in sort of an intelligent manner. Hey, we've seen some of these IP addresses, but honestly, these are the top talkers right here. These are the, the, the ones that are most important. That's the stuff we want to get legal process out on to start preserving and actually follow up on. Uh, there are a finite amount of FBI cyber agents, and we can't take one incident and uh, essentially dedicate the entire squad to it unless it gets to a, you know, a certain level, a fairly substantial level. Um, we do have multiple cases we have to work at the same time. So the more you know, the more educated you are about your own network and the types of information that would be anomalous, that would be concerning, lets you have a high, a high level of confidence of what might actually have been, uh, you know, um, attacker or attack behavior. And that's the kind of stuff that we can focus on and focus on quickly. And also understanding what, what your network looks like from the outside, right? So how many of you, raise your hand if you're familiar with Shodan, All right? Search engine for industrial control systems. A few years back, DHS actually had to go out to a lot of industrial control systems owners and operators and tell them that they were directly visible and open to the internet with default passwords and, and whatnot, right? Um, HMIs connected to the internet. So. Um, using tools like Shodan on your own environment and understanding what, you know, what you look like from the outside, what might be connected that has a hard-coded password is, is another tool that you can use. And if you're not using it, you better hope nobody else is using it either, which is kind of hoping against hope, right? I'll just add one quick comment to that. That is, um, it, it's a very good, um, a very good focus to have. Take a look at your network from the outside. So many companies actually don't, or they uh, forget to do so because you're so focused internally, which of course is where most of your time should be. But we'll get um, at cases that'll come in to where, you know, they, hey, these kind of packets are never on our network. This never happens. Um, so we'll start blocking it and working with you on, you know, analysis of everybody that was sending this. And then they find out there's some developer that says, hey, my packets aren't being, you know, my, my um, files aren't being sent to our other site. You find out, oh, they actually are on your network. So having that sort of baseline and understanding of, of who uses what um, can let you know whether uh, traffic that's going outside and back into your network is or is not anomalous. Um, but at the same time, knowing that these open connections exist from the outside so that uh, you know you can shut them down before we show up to your doorstep and find out, hey, we found it open on the internet that, uh, the, you know, that this was a way right into your network, an open vulnerability that who knows how many other people have seen um, is obviously not where you want to be. Um, so it's, it's important to take, take that outside look. Uh, one, one helpful thing that we implemented uh, at Riverside was GOID blocking. Local municipality, uh, you're running a local utility. What business do you have of exposing your IP space to potential APT mm -hmm. known states? Um, so this is you know low cost, easy to implement with minimal impact, but reduces that the exposure, reduces the attack surface. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's important. And when you start thinking about a lot of security, is it's it's. It's the low-cost stuff. It, it's the collaboration. It, it's you're not paying any money to go share information on threats. Uh, understanding your network, looking at that, um, and I think what's even more important from an industrial control system perspective is, you know, you've got proprietary, outdated systems, and there's been a lot of money invested in them. So you're not going to go into an oil and gas company and tell them to yank everything out. There's all these, you know, the every foreign government's targeting your system. So that that means you need to look at alternative approaches. Um, and some of that is through the sound security principles. In fact, you know, as, as we look at it, so, so what, what can you do? I mean, first off, um, even for everyone in this room, I, I mean, I'm, again, just for people understanding the awareness that there is a threat out there. Um, and and uh, while we're talking about the threat, Tom, I'll, I'll point to you just real quickly. I mean, you work globally. Is, is the U.S. behind in its perception of the threat environment, and are you seeing a lot more 
activity, proactivity. I mean, Nozomi is based in Europe. You've started there. You've got a lot of product sold. Correction, very important, with, especially with the audience, based in the U.S. <laughs> 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 we're, yeah, we're, our, our, most of our development, our founder started in actually Switzerland, um, and then they're over here. But uh, um, there's not too much I can comment on that for various reasons, uh, security and outing um, our customers. But I will notice that you know, there's some lowlights and highlights that I see you know, between North America and I would say mainly Europe, especially North America, I mean Northern Europe. Um, Northern Europe seems to be quite um, ahead of the curve in investing in uh, power grid uh, solution, oh, ICS cybersecurity solutions for the power grid. Um, and you know they're 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 bleeding edge there. So, uh, but with that said, um, you know there's bright lights in the U.S. Duke Energy, arguably I think it's the largest utility in the U.S. is doing some really great things. That actually I was exposed to prior to even joining Nozomi when I was on the customer side and networking, which they call Coalition of the Willing, and it's optimizing the grid um, with the microgrid projects. Obviously that changes the dynamic. That opens up the grid to new vulnerabilities, new threats. Um, but they're also addressing that as well. Um, and uh, a use case uh, within the U.S. is Vermont Electric. Uh, we're seeing some bright lights here in the U.S. for small utilities that might have the um, ability to be more agile um, due to just being a small enterprise and being able to move more quickly and adopt new bleeding edge technologies like ours, for example. Uh, but also they kind of have to because they don't have the payroll and the personnel to have tons of CISOs and a big uh, threat uh, you know, monitoring team. Um, so they're kind of coaxed uh, by need into adopting a solution like ours. Um, so I guess the short story is, yeah, I see Northern Europe really bleeding the edge, maybe being the early adopter. I don't know if that's always the wise thing. Um, uh, and the U.S. is doing a lot of great things as well. So. Uh, it's a mixed bag. I can't okay. really comment. I can say that industries, uh, I can say that the power industry is definitely leading the way, uh, largely because they have to, right? It's regulatory. The cost of a security breach is huge. National security, uh, you know, I, human safety, everything, revenue. Um, and uh, we're starting to, uh, you know, see the adoption in other uh, critical uh, verticals as well. Yeah, so it's, you know, again, going back to, you know, the awareness, training, um, understanding your environment where you can get the visibility, um, making, you know, being aware of resources such as what, uh, what DHS and the FBI can provide. I mean, there's a wealth of information out there, and, uh, and they're eager and anxious to, to safeguard critical infrastructure um, throughout the country. So, you know, th those, are, those are assets and tools that are available, information assets that, that you that are available for you, so just take advantage of them. Um, and sure, <coughs> go ahead. Just to the last question, I mean, generally speaking, um, I think from our perspective, the attackers are getting better faster than the defenders are, right? Which is a bad place to be. Um, so, you know, our, our real focus is, you know, you don't have unlimited budgets, you don't have unlimited manpower, you know, woman power, whatever, right? But you do have the ability to take advantage of what you can that's going to be a no cost low cost solution so that you can focus your your you know limited dollars on um, on actually making the problems start to go away right and so we're really um, DHS FBI we're really trying to focus on trying to bend that curve back so that you know the defenders are actually at least keeping pace uh, with what the attackers are doing and uh, what I would add to that, too, is uh, we want to be contacted. So I'm trying to put my face out here. We do this, you know, in various cities um, that, that are having similar type events to let you know that it's not the, you know, this scary agency to contact, uh, you know, and, and at the same time that your first contact with the FBI isn't in the middle of an incident and trying to uh, go to our main uh, office number and get routed around. I want you to be able to have my contact information so you know who to contact in the area. or. If it's an, uh, your company, but maybe it's a different office and it's going to be another FBI office that would contact, I'm happy to route that, uh, route that call so that you have the right point of contact. Uh, it's important for us to get involved earlier and ideally prior to an event. I'm happy to have that dialogue with you, whether it's over the phone or, or a face-to-face -face contact, so that you have my contact information. And then on top of that, even in incidents that you look at and go, well, these, this is something we thwarted, or it was an attack, but you know our, our defenses were were sufficient to uh, to thwart it. We want to be contacted in the sense that that intelligence is valuable to us, 
there may be other similar um, companies or, uh, or potential victims in your same industry that aren't seeing the same visibility that you are because maybe you're a little ahead of the curve than they are. This is information that, that it can ultimately be shared. And I don't mean that you guys, thwart, you know, your particular company name, you know, named uh, is the one that thwarted this attack. It's just uh, certain attack information, IP addresses or domains or infected systems that were calling out to a, a particular location. Some of this kind of information can be used to, to share, certainly with other FBI offices, but potentially other victims as well. Um, to where we can get ahead in the sense that we're helping with the information sharing while masking the, uh, the victim name as well. But the, the bottom selling point that I'm trying to take forward is I want to be contacted. Um, I don't want you to feel it's a waste of time to be contacting me. Um, every time we, we talk doesn't mean we're going to be opening a new case, but at least we can have that dialogue, and I'd rather do that and give you something to, to take away with it uh, rather than have you not contact me when it would have been something that would have been fairly significant. Well, thank you. So with um, we've got two minutes left. If anybody's got any questions, I'll certainly open it up for questions now. I would say we, uh, I was at an event where Darren was speaking probably six months ago in Ontario, and we've taken up, up, up on the free uh, Department of Homeland Security vulnerability assessment, so we've started that process. It is very easy, and you know, I encourage people to do that if you have uh, critical infrastructure. My question is, why do you suppose we still haven't there's not some kind of law or regulation for all critical infrastructure to require some basic security uh, because it seems to me like everybody's doing their own thing except for the power industry. Kind of power any, any comments or thoughts on that? So I'll wade into that uh, <laughs> muddy water there. So, uh, I mean, the, the short, the short, sorry. Yeah. The short answer is, you know, there, there was an effort uh, a few years back and, and, you know, Congress didn't really pass, uh, pass the law. Um, and that's not commenting on whether it was good or whether whether it's bad. It's just a just a fact. Uh, several of the critical infrastructure um, uh, sectors that have sector specific agencies that have regulatory responsibilities are starting to wade into the what would regulation look like um, uh, discussion. Right. Uh, so you know, a few years back, EPA said, well, we're we're not going to regulate, you know, cybersecurity, but we're going to encourage adoption of the NIST cybersecurity framework, and then measure the adoption, and then see whether or not we actually need to regulate. So there's there's efforts to kind of feel out what that would look like in many industries, um, because you know obviously you get a lot of a lot of pushback from those that would be regulated, um, and a lot of you know good reasons why. You know, maybe it works in a certain sector and it doesn't work in another. But there, there, there's been discussion and there have been uh, movements forward. But uh, those agencies that currently have regulatory authority tend to also have the ability to, through their own processes, you know, build upon those those authorities. That's kind of where we are now. All righty. Uh, one last question. Okay. Um, I heard of a doctor forum for cybersecurity forum. Um, I know a lot of my college, we have interest in working to help the company voluntarily. Do you have know any program that we can join? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's, um, there are, sorry. I know there are um, organizations that do, um, first of all, organizations that have collaboration and, and information sharing in their your title, Secret Service, FBI, you know, InfraGuard, Electronic Crimes Task Forces, things like that. In terms of volunteering to actually do cybersecurity work, um, one one recommendation, I guess, would be um, I, I met someone from an organization last night at, based out of San Jose that actually does some of that with the industry. Um, I don't know if they've gotten to the point where they're doing it with um, with the universities yet, um, and I, I can't recall the name of the 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 organization right off the top of my head, unfortunately. But um, there's also a, uh, opportunities through uh, like scholarship for service program within uh, different uh, universities and with DHS and NSA. And um, potentially, you know, state and local governments might be accepting interns or, you know, paid or unpaid uh, that wouldn't necessarily be, you know, if you're paid, you're not a volunteer. but. That way you can kind of get into a program, learn more about, you know, how the program's operated and structured, 
and then you know, use that as part of furthering both your education and your professional development. Um, and there's also a, a, a highly encouraged going to the, the lunchtime uh, keynote where we'll have one of our experts from DHS on education and awareness, and that might be a good question there as well. Already on that note, I want to first uh, thank, thank Darren, Brian, Tom. Um, excellent discussion. Thank everybody for attending and your active participation. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and certainly invite you to visit CGI at booth number six in the Solution Hall. So thank you.